Welcome to Lesson 1 of Through the Bible in a Year. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. We pray for your spirit to lead us and guide us as we work our way through the Bible, that we can understand it in deeper ways and, and have the power by your spirit to live out these words in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you missed the introductory video, just a reminder that this is a one-year study, and you'll be able to find a reading schedule online as well as a worksheet for each week's readings from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. We'll be going starting with um, Genesis and the New Testament Matthew and kind of going simultaneously through the Old New Testament together. And then at the end of your week of reading, there's this video which will summarize what you read the past week and answering the questions that you worked through during the previous week. Got a lot of ground to cover today. These videos are gonna be about a half hour in length and. I'm going to have to get through a lot of material today, so I'm going to jump right in, and we're going to start with Genesis chapter 1, and question 1 is, how is God in His fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, active in chapter 1? And what we see is, in the beginning, God, Elohim, God the Father created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. So we see the Spirit of God, God the Father, and in John chapter 1, we get to that section, talks about how Jesus was also active in the process of creation. So God in his fullness. In fact, the word Elohim is singular and plural at the same time that God in his fullness created not just the earth, but all of the heavens. He created everything. And what we see in scripture is that he created it in seven days. For six days he worked, the seventh day he rested. The next question, what does the word create mean? Can we as humans beings, can we create? How would you describe the process of how God created and what is the crown of his creation? And so as I mentioned, you know, for six days God did the work of creation, the seventh day he rested, and create means make something out of nothing. You know, we as human beings cannot do that. We can take what's there and reorganize, but God creates. He makes something out of nothing. Only he can do that. And he creates everything, but the crown of his creation is mankind. And if you want to go deeper into you know, the first part of Genesis and the process of creation, especially in chapter 1, you will see 13 times in chapter 1 where God says that he creates everything after its own kind. Almost like God knew the debate between creation and evolution would take place one day. And he's saying, you know what, I created every species after its own kind. That Every species has its own DNA code. It's almost like he could, could foresee this debate going on. And, you know, even when you think about the world today, a lot of people believe we got here by some freak chance form of nature, evolution, just, you know, rocks colliding and somehow life coming from that. You know, to be honest with you, how can life come from rocks? You know, how can something as complex as our human existence come out of things that don't have life at all, as far as ability to feel, to, to think, to process the way we do. The complexity of life is, is so amazing. And more and more, even scientists are realizing that evolution has serious flaws as a theory for a reason because it's never been proven. It never will be proven. It never will become a law. But yet so many people believe it's how we got here. But yet science more and more is showing a lot of holes in evolution and they're pointing more and more to intelligent design. But yet, they're not able to quite figure out how that intelligence design came into being. Some say, maybe, well, aliens put us here. Well, then who created them? Our belief is that God created the heavens and the earth, and we're not some freak chance, random process how we got here. No, God planned for us. He loves us. He cares for us. And we're here because of Him and all of creation. And we're the crown of creation as human beings. Question three, how does Satan work to de deceive in chapter three? Does Satan know scripture? If so, how close does he use it? You know, or how does he use it? So Satan obviously has a knowledge of Scripture because he comes to Adam and Eve in, in the garden. In particular, um, we see he works on, on Adam. And, you know, he, he takes Scripture and he twists it. You know, like, hey, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God, knowing good and, and evil. And that's kind of what he does. He knows the Scripture. He doesn't follow it. But how he uses it is to twist it to try to get people to turn away from God. And so Satan's whole purpose is to pull people away from God. We see this, you know, God on the one side of love and Satan on the other side of hate and death and God love and life. And, and so we're going to see this battle going on more and more in Scripture. We see it all around us in the world in which we live. 
Question four. Listen what happens to Adam and Eve as a result of the fall into sin. So they have one simple rule. Do not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. Do not touch it or you will die. So what do they do? Well, Eve takes some of the fruit and gives it to her husband with who doesn't ask, okay, what's going on here? And they eat and sin comes into the world by their choice. Okay, they had this one simple rule. They broke it. What happens? They become ashamed of themselves, ashamed of their own bodies. They become ashamed of each other. Um, the situation with creation, which was perfect before, breaks down. For now, from this point forth, we have to work hard to survive in this planet. Their relationship with God is damaged. God had every right to come in and, and destroy everything and start over again. That's not what he does. He stays true to his creation, as we're going to see in the next question. What is the significance of Genesis 3.15? And so God makes a promise to Adam and Eve. He says a descendant of Eve is going to come and crush the head of Satan. And this is very key. This is the first evidence of the plan of salvation. That God is going to send someone, a descendant of Eve, who's one day going to come and crush the head of Satan. And you're going to find all these endless genealogies through the Old Testament, and they're all being traced, and we're going to see even a little bit, right up to Jesus. And Jesus would come to fulfill this prophecy, defeat Satan, sin, and death once and for all. So we see that God promises, okay, Adam and Eve, you messed it up, but I'm going to fix this. A Savior is going to come. He's going to make things right. He's going to restore the broken relationships which have taken place as a result of sin. And it's important to realize that the sin is a serious problem. And even after sin came in the world, we see even with the next question how things break down and it gets even worse. What do we learn from sin, the sin of Cain? What does it mean that sin is crouching at the door waiting to devour you? And so their first two sons, Cain and Abel, and you would think that, okay, Cain, the oldest one, maybe they were thinking, okay, the line that goes to Jesus is going to go through Cain, but far from it. That what's going to happen rather than, you know, him being the part of the one crushing the head of the serpent, um, he's going to crush the head of his own brother, Abel. They're offering sacrifice to God, and God accepts Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. Obviously, he's giving with the wrong intent in his mind, and he gets jealous. He gets angry, and he turns on his brother, and he kills him. And it says, God says, sin is crouching at the door, waiting to devour you. And that's the way it is in this world. There's temptation all around us. There's, we're living in a troubled world, and the reason the world's troubled is because of sin. To simplify things, there's sin and there's love. And love is the opposite of sin, and sin is living outside the bounds of love. And the problem with the world today, the problem with the world always has been sin. And we see that very thing happening with Cain and Abel, and, and so Cain is banished. And his descendants are going to be going in kind of, a, for the most part, a pretty bad direction. Abel's dead. The next son is Seth. We're going to see the line of Christ is going to go through son number three on towards that journey to the genealogy of, of Jesus. Question seven. How do we account for the longevity of the lives of the people in the first part of Genesis? What does Genesis 6, 3, or how does it change that? And what we see is when it comes to the longevity of life, that God lets them live a long time at first. He, he controls everything. He controls time and life, and some are living over 900 years. But we see in 6.3 that God changes that. He says, um, I, you know, my spirit will not contend with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be 120 years. It's like God puts in this max capacity for how long we can live. And what you will find is for those that were alive at that time, they still lived their long lives. But, you know, generations after this, what happens is that 120 kicks in. And even in this day and age, people don't live past 120. They live close. There's no evidence of ever anybody living past 120. I read about somebody that claimed they were, that there's some, the family claimed she was 122, but as they delved into it, they had no proof that that was the case. So maybe around 120, that's that max capacity. And don't know about you, but I don't think I want to live that long. Um, the great thing is we're going to be living forever, but that's when the, the lifespans became shorter from that point on. Question eight. What led up to the flood? What kind of person was Noah? How would you have reacted in his situation? And how did the animals get into the ark? 
And so the situation with mankind after Adam and Eve, it gets worse. There's, they're going their own ways. They're living in sin. There's, there's all kinds of terrible things happening. And, and God chooses and allows for a flood to come upon the earth. But before that happens, he reaches out to a righteous man by the name of Noah, who has three sons and their wives. And, and they're commissioned to build this huge ark in, the, in kind of an arid desert area. People thought, probably thought they're nuts. Why are you building an ark in dry land? When the flood came, obviously it all became clear, and it's God, the God of the universe, who allows for these animals to get onto the ark. And if you, in fact, there's, I know there's actually an ark expedition, and I've heard incredible things about that. And the ark was built to be larger than a football field, three stories high, plenty large enough to, to inhabit um, two of the main, or the animals of the earth, and seven of certain ones that were to be part of the sacrificial system. But God is the one who made all these things happen. It goes beyond human ability for this to take place, but God worked through Noah and his family. And we see in Noah an incredible example of righteousness and faith, but even he, as we see on the other side of the ark story, is a flawed human being and he makes mistakes in his own personal life. Next question. In what directions do the sons of Noah spread and what nationalities do they eventually take on? And so, as one son, Ham, moves to the south and inhabits Egypt down towards Africa, Japheth goes more to the north and towards Asia, maybe parts of Europe. And Shem, the remaining son, he stays in the Middle East area, and through his lineage will come the line of Christ as well. Um, and so his descendants are the ones who are going to inhabit the, the area of the Middle East. Why are there so many languages in the world? Well, there was obviously one language, and you read about the Tower of Babel where they're coming together and they're, they're building these, these huge um, monuments that were you know, kind of false gods, and, and God decides, you know, I'm going to confuse our language. And we see a lot of times God talks about, let us. You know, who's he talking to? He's not talking to the angels. God is singular, but he's plural. He's one God, but he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through the scriptures. He's, he's singular but there's a plurality within the singularity. And God confuses the language of the people. They begin to spread out and inhabit different parts of the world according to their different language groups. Sometimes you wonder, why not one language? Wouldn't it make more sense with one language? We have thousands of language and dialects in the world. Um, we see evidence here as how that all began to take place. Who is Abram? And why did God choose him? What are some of the weaknesses and his strengths? Now we're going to begin a study of Abram, and eventually his name is going to become Abraham. The ah means breath of God. So he's, he's going to be changed from Abram to father, to father of, of many, to father of many nations. And God chooses him. He's a righteous man. And his wife Sarai is going to become Sarah. And he basically says, okay, take your family, take your possessions, and I want you to go where I want you to go. He's, he doesn't really lay out clearly where they're going to go. It's very unusual in that day and age for them to leave their land where they live. They stayed typically in one place for generations, but to go where he wanted them to go. And he trusted them. I mean, he, God, trust, God trusted them to do it, and they trusted God, and they went. And they um, just begin this journey. And we see in Abraham, as his name eventually has changed, a person of great faith, but sometimes a flawed human being. In a couple situations, he, he lies about his wife, who's a very beautiful woman, as different kings want to have her be part of their um, concubine. And he didn't have the courage to say, well, that's my wife. He says, my half-sister. And, and so we see not a perfect person, but we're going to see as you follow his life, a man of great faith faith and integrity. And God makes a promise to him. He says, your descendants are going to be as numerous as stars in the sky and the sands in the seashore. And he didn't have a son yet. We're going to see that journey as we go along here. But he trusts God and he's going to take on the name of eventually Father Abraham. And we're going to learn a lot about him as we proceed. And question 12, who is the angel of the Lord? Now, in the New Testament, we see reference to an angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, it's the angel of the Lord. And what we're going to see time and time again as we encounter the angel of the Lord is we're going to also see God speaking. And so it's believed, you're going to see this 
over and over again as we go through the Old Testament, I want you to test this as we go through it. You're going to see that, you know, we're, the angel Lord is speaking, God is speaking. So how could this angel be like God? It's believed that this angel could very well be Jesus' activity in the Old Testament. And we'll refer back to this as we see more references as we move along. We're now going to jump into the New Testament and to Matthew's mentioned. Every week we'll have the Old Testament readings and the New Testament readings, and your worksheets too have questions for each section. Question one, why is the genealogy of Jesus important? How do we account for the differences in the genealogy between Matthew and Luke? Now, Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. He was a tax collector. And we're going to see that his gospel is written for a Jewish audience which is more of a patriarchal audience. And, and you're going to see a lot of Old Testament quotes. And it's believed that his genealogy follows the genealogy of, of Joseph, the half, you know, the stepfather, you know, of, of, of um, Jesus. And what we're going to see with this is there's going to be some slight differences between this genealogy and Luke that follows the line of Mary is believed. And I'm, this is what I believe and in history seems to indicate this is the case. There's some slight differences in the last few generations. It's because I believe that we, with you know, Matthew with Joseph's genealogy up to Jesus, and with Luke we have Mary's genealogy up to Jesus, and that would be the correct one, the most accurate. But it's really interesting how this genealogy is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 315, which we saw just a little bit ago, that Jesus is a fulfillment of that one who would come to crush the head of Satan. And within this genealogy, you find some, a lot of the heroes of the faith we're going to recognize as we go through the Bible, but there's a couple of people in particular that I find very interesting. Rahab the prostitute from Jericho, um, Ruth the Moabite, you know, people that weren't even Jewish in the line of Jesus and the roles that they're going to have. We're going to learn more about them later. And so often we see in the Bible is that the underdogs become the heroes. We'll come back to that at another time. But this genealogy is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And that's where we're going to see endless chapters of so-and-so gave birth to so-and-so gave birth to so-and-so following this genealogy from Adam and Eve all the way up to Jesus. Question two, what roles do Mary and Joseph play in the birth of Jesus? Who do you think plays the key role, and how are their roles different? Now, Joseph is the stepfather of Jesus. You know, Mary is the one that gives birth. God is the father. Probably Mary's role in many regards is more important, but what's interesting in Matthew is we see more about Joseph's role. And to me, he's an unsung hero in the Bible. And as you go through to, you know, the sections on Joseph, count how many words he speaks. And what you're going to see is not one recorded word that he ever says. But what you see in Matthew is that Joseph was a man of incredible integrity and honor who trusted God and responded time and time again, especially to protect Jesus from um, danger that could have gone his way. He could have easily been killed by Herod and, and by others. Um, but Joseph is just obedient to God. Actions speak louder than words, and Joseph is a prime example of this particular thing coming into fruition. And so often in life, I think we should focus more on actions, even sometimes in our words. Sometimes there's so many words in the world that are not backed by actions. We have a God of action, a Savior of action. And Joseph is an example for us of what action is meant to look like. And we're going to learn, by the way, more about Mary. Luke really gets more into the life of Mary. We're going to see that more as we proceed through the Gospels. Each Gospel has a similar outline, but has different content that brings similar content, but sometimes different views into the lives of the various characters in the Bible. Question three, notice all the Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in Matthew. What group was Matthew trying to reach in particular? We kind of already indicated this. His goal was to reach a Jewish audience who focused on the Old Testament. And what Matthew is doing is showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies. And so we see all these beautiful Old Testament prophecies interwoven through Matthew and being fulfilled in Jesus. Why did Jesus have to go to Egypt? How many words does Joseph speak? What is more powerful action or words? And kind of a repeat I've already talked about, but he goes to you know, Egypt because Joseph in a dream is warned that Herod is going to try to kill the child. And so again, it's an example of Joseph going to Egypt to protect Jesus. And again, we see through these sections the actions of Joseph, and but not a single word recorded. And so God works through Joseph to keep Jesus safe. And so this plan that God has to bring salvation to the world will not be destroyed. Question six, what do we know about the early life of Jesus? We don't know a lot. 
You know, Luke is going to give us a clearer picture when we get to that gospel. But we see more is that Mary and Joseph followed everything according to the law. They did everything the right way. That he grew up in this family and his father was a carpenter. And um, we don't know a lot, but we're going to see a little bit more evidence as we get to Luke. Because most of the gospels focus on his life from the age of 30 to the age of 33. Why was Jesus baptized and how did his baptism differ from the baptism that, um, that he was to introduce? And so he's baptized by John the Baptist and it was a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said his baptism was going to be with the Holy Spirit. And so John's baptism was kind of a forerunner. You know, Jesus' baptism that he was going to introduce was going to be different. But the interesting thing is, Jesus didn't need to be baptized for himself, per se, because he never sinned. He didn't need to repent and turn away from his sin because he never sinned. But he does it to identify himself with us. He does it as kind of a coronation to the beginning of his earthly ministry. Now at the age of 30, he's going to start his ministry. And by the way, he's starting at the age of 30 because as he has followed everything by the law, a person could not be a priest until the age of 30. He's taken on the role of prophet, priest, and king. And so he could have started earlier um, being God in human form, but he's following the law, he's beginning his ministry at age 30, and this baptism is kind of the send-off, the kick-off of his ministry. And the, so much attention has been focused on John for, you know, basically for, for all this time, they had not had, you know, a prophet. And John came on the scene, and, and um, you know, with him there was, was great, you know, to do, you know, and, and just a lot of, of um focus on him because it's been so quiet for 400 years and here's John coming to the scene and he was this, this guy of, you know, just, you know, did things differently, he ate, you know, locusts and wild honey and he just it was strong message. But now the focus is going to go away from John and the focus is going to go to Jesus. And even in the Gospel of John later on we're going to see that John the Baptist says, I must become less, he must become greater. Question nine, how does the devil try to deceive Jesus? Where else do we see this in the scripture? How does the devil try to deceive us? What can we learn from the way Jesus handled this situation? You know, what's really interesting here is, is when it comes right down to it, the devil, as we saw in Genesis, he knows the scripture. He, just, he twists it. And here, as he's tempting Jesus, Jesus goes from this baptism now in the wilderness for 40 days. He's fasting, he's, he's hungry, he's, he's thirsty, and he's weakened, but, and the devil's trying to get through and get him to, to crack, get him to sin, lead him on a wrong path. And he twists the scripture to do it, but each time Jesus comes back with the pure word of God, and Satan has no recourse against that. And so we see the example from Jesus here that, that the, the word of God is powerful to know what the Word of God is all about because Satan wants to deceive us. There's so many different religions in the world. A lot of them have been put together um, with false religions by deception of people changing the Word of God, twisting it. That's what Satan is all about. It's important to learn the Word of God for what it is and to let the Scripture interpret itself. And what we see here is, is that Jesus is, is, is tied and he's, he is the Word that became flesh. He's, he's the living Word and he comes back each time with Satan's temptations with the pure Word and Satan has no recourse against that until eventually he has to retreat himself away from Jesus because he's not making any headway. How can we be fishers of men? How can we be light and salt? What is the fulfillment of the law? And so we go through some teachings of Jesus and called the Sermon on the Mount and a lot of very powerful teachings. And to be fishers of men means that we are people that are supposed to share the word of God with others. Um, that God's word is, is not something we're to keep to ourselves. And our calling is to go out into the world and to share who he is with others. That, that Jesus wants the world to come to know of his love. He's chosen people like us to do that work. He could have done it himself. He could have snapped his finger and said, okay, the world, all believe. And it would have happened. But he's given us free will. He's given us free choice. And now in his free choice, he's calling upon us to be part of his plan, to be part of his team, to share his love in this world in which we live. As far as salt and light, 
you know, salt is to add flavor to the world. And it's like, it was like a preservative back then. And, and we are to add flavor to the world. We're to be the light of the world. In the world of darkness, we're to shine the light of Christ. We're not to be holding back, that we're to make a difference in this world. And the fulfillment of the law is in Christ. There's only one person who's followed God's law perfectly, and that's Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the law. And we should try to follow the law, not because it's going to save us. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But our desire should be to live by the law because we want to follow it for the glory of God. We want to thank him for what he's done for us. We'll talk more about this as we go through this study. What does Jesus say about conflict resolution in 523 through 26? And what he says is that, you know, we are called upon to resolve problems. Don't let things fester. You got a problem with someone? Go work it out. The tendency so often in life is to sweep things under the rug and just you know, just kind of run away from the problems. And all they do is get worse. If you see a spark, put it out before it turns into fire. If there's a problem you're having with somebody, work it out. Don't let things fester. And we see his call to us to work out the difficulties, the challenges we have with others, and, and do it in an attitude of love and forgiveness. What does Jesus say in regards to prayer in 6, 5 through 14? Now, I could be spending hours on, there's so many, so much incredible content here. He introduces the Lord's Prayer. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. You know, don't be standing in the high places and, you know, trying to bring attention to yourself, but go off by yourself. And, and you know, it's not about the, the length of your prayer, it's about the, the content. And, and he gives us the Lord's Prayer, this beautiful prayer that, that breaks down what really is most important in the Lord's Prayer is something for us to, to think through, to, to follow. Our Father who art in heaven, we have a common Father to worship and to praise. You know, hallowed be thy name, that, to praise him for who he is, our Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the purpose of God, that he wants us to, you know, to receive Jesus. That Jesus came to earth and we one day go to heaven and, and to do the will of the Father that says on earth as it is in heaven, it tells me that God wants to have a great life now and a great life forever. The next part is give us this day our daily bread. We're asking God, we're not just praying for ourselves, we're praying for the world. God provide the daily sustenance this world needs for people to get by from day to day and at the same time not just physical bread or physical food but even spiritual bread. He's a bread of life. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. That's pardon. God, bring me forgiveness. Forgive me my sins. And, and please bring forgiveness to all the people on this planet. It's a big prayer. We're praying for everybody that they have what they need in this life physically and, and spiritually to find forgiveness. And give me the strength to forgive others and other people the strength to forgive others as well. Because if you can't forgive people, you know, you're living in a state in which you know, you're, you're miserable. That as you hold on to the sins of others, it just brings you down to let things go, to give things to God and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is asking for God's protection, not just for us, but for everybody, or the force of evil in this world. And this is a beautiful outline on how to pray to God. And prayer is powerful because God is powerful. In question 13, what are the most important treasures to store up? What do you think these treasures represent? Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The point being, treasures in heaven are not things from the world because nothing earthly goes to heaven. What goes to heaven are the souls of people that God wants us to be involved in the lives of people here to direct them to heaven. And the ultimate thing that can happen one day we're in heaven and, and people come up, or the souls of people come up to us and say, hey, thanks for helping to get me here that what matters in life are things that have eternal significance. But we live in a world that puts so much emphasis on the worldly stuff, the temporary stuff. What matters to God are the souls of people. And finally, what does chapter 6, 25 through 34 tell us about dealing with anxiety? Jesus does not want us to have fear. Fear deals with the past, okay? It deals with being afraid of, you know, phobias from things that have happened in our past. Worry tends to deal with the future. Anxiety, I'm sorry, worry deals with the present. Anxiety deals with the future. And Jesus deals with all these worry and fear and anxiety. And the king, he's saying, don't worry about stuff. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide what you need in this life. Don't have fear and worry and anxiety. 
Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Know that I'm going to help you through this life. I'm going to help you forever. Your future is secure. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about today. Don't worry about yesterday. Trust and know that God is going to help us. Sometimes it's going to be challenging, but he's going to provide. And even through the challenges, we're going to see that we can grow through them. But imagine a life free of fear, anxiety, and worry. He wants us to live in joy and love, not in fear not in worry, not in anxiety. That leads us through the sections for today. Again, this is a snapshot, okay? This is not an in-depth study. I would love to have more time to talk about each of these individually, but it's kind of an overview. I hope this was beneficial as closing prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word. There's so much there. We covered so much ground today. Help us to take your words to heart. Help us to live these words out in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.